Welcome to worship at the University Church in Yale on this Sunday after the first week of classes. Congratulations to all the students and faculty who made it through the quarantine period. And we have great prayers for our continued safety, but welcome, welcome, welcome. It is great to have you here. I'm Pastor Ian Oliver, and on behalf of our, all our church community and my colleague, Pastor Jenny Peek, and all our wonderful new graduate staff and virtual choir, we wanna welcome you. It's, we're eager to get to know you. You're welcome here, whatever your journey with God. If you're someone who couldn't imagine a Sunday without being in church, or if you're someone who's never really been to worship before, you're welcome here. If you're someone with a million questions and a lot of doubt, or if you're someone who feels rooted and grounded in Christ, you're welcome here. Or if you're someone who's felt rejected and excluded by the church, you are among friends here. Every week we learn a little more about how to make Zoom a sacred space. And we suggest today that to whatever extent your living space allows, you create a space without other distractions. Turn off other devices, resist the temptation to check your email or Facebook, even if alerts are flashing on your screen. And when our virtual choir is leading us in hymns uh, and the words appear on your screen, you're invited to mute yourself and sing along as enthusiastically as you can. <laughs> if you wish to receive communion today, we're celebrating our first uh, full virtual communion. Uh, and you have bread or juice in reach, I invite you to run and get them now if you wish uh, and have them within reach uh, when we get to that point in the service. There's a link to the written bulletin uh, with full music scores and prayers that's being posted now in the chat if you'd like to follow along. And if you're new to UCY and haven't reached out to us, please share your info in the information form that's being posted now and we will get back to you and get you a UCY t-shirt and prayer book as a bonus. And now, as we quiet our anxious, busy brains after this first week and seek our hearts and souls and reach out to God, let us pray. Oh Lord, you are our shepherd, our friend, our teacher, our savior. As we come to worship today, help us open our hearts to celebrate the glorious history of your saving acts for your people. Help us give thanks for everything good in our lives. Open our minds to learn things about you we don't already know and apply them in our daily lives. Draw us together across this weird Zoom connection. And as we are welcomed at your table today, let us all be fed and united. Amen. Our first hymn is God is Here. I'll invite you to mute and sing along.
Good morning. I am delighted that we are going to bring back this morning sharing Christ's peace together. As the deacons were gathered for our fall retreat yesterday, we remarked, what are we missing from church? And one of them immediately said, passing the peace. So we are going to pass the peace together. I invite you to turn your screen to gallery view so that we might see as many faces as possible. Phoebe is putting in the chat your response. You're welcome to unmute yourselves. But we will say the response, wave, and delight in one another's presence, and then turn to our first reading of the day from our Deacon Ben. The peace of Christ be always with you. And, and also, also with you. you. And also, also with indeed all of you. Peace of Christ. And now we turn it to Ben. Ben, I'm a junior undergraduate in Yale College, and I'm a student deacon. Our reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter eight, verses eight, chapter thirteen, verses eight through fourteen. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments: You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to Hi, everyone. I am Phoebe. I am a... Um, second year Masters of Divinity student uh, at Yale Divinity School, and I'm the new liturgical coordinator here at UCY. Our gospel reading today is from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the good news of the gospel. Praise, Praise to you, to you Praise. O Christ. Christ. Please join me in prayer as we begin um, the sermon section. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on this place. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. On Thursday morning, Reverend Ian and I gathered with 35 other religious leaders from around campus. We gather every month under the leadership of the university chaplain, Sharon Kugler, who we had a delight of seeing and meeting last week. Each month we gather as the YRM members, the Yale Religious Ministries leaders. And let, you, let me tell you, looking across the table, or in this case, the Zoom gallery view room, and seeing the faces of these many diverse leaders, it's a beautiful sight. 
While we are leaders with different worldviews, religious traditions, and theologies, we still share the same mission, namely caring for the spiritual lives and general well-being of Yale's marvelous student body. At our meeting this year, Paul Hoffman, the director of Yale Mental Health and Counseling, visited us. He shared about how students are doing during this time. Not surprisingly, the Counseling Center's numbers are up, both with new students and returning students reaching out. We discussed together the various reasons why more students are seeking help and how we can support them. Dr. Hoffman asked us to list reasons why we thought that this might be, and unsurprisingly, the list was quite long. And I think if we were to ask this gathered congregation, the reasons you would list would be very similar to the reasons we did. But something Dr. Hoffman said towards the end of the conversation really struck me, a reason I hadn't thought about for the rise in needing good mental health care. Namely, that students, and all of us for that matter, are dealing with unprecedented levels of conflict. Conflict with roommates, partners, and family over having to share the same living space. Conflict over how to deal with the coronavirus. What really is safe? What's an overreaction? How do I negotiate things when my roommate and I feel differently? When my needs aren't the same as my partner's or my best friend's needs? conflict politically. And as we all are feeling conflict across our country's most silent yet persistently deadly struggle with racism. Conflict. As Christians, how are we as Christian people meant to deal with conflict? One could write their thesis on this pressing question. And if they did, I suspect that they would find that the Christian response to conflict is multifaceted. There is, of course, no one simple answer for every and all situations. Rats, the answer today isn't the rule book for all conflict. Yet today's scriptures still speak to the question of Christian conflict in a profound and life-giving way for us today. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, speak to a community that knows what it is to struggle with difference, inequity and injustice, and the everyday challenges of, that come with being a human who has family members and friends and coworkers and people you're being in relationship to. Love your neighbor, Paul writes. For one who has loved another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. In other words, the commandments that instruct us to, as the physicians say, do no harm can all in Paul's world, words be summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself, words that we know he borrows from Christ himself. But Christ knows that try as we might to love our neighbors, we're going to falter. We are going to harm others, sometimes intentionally and other times unintentionally. And in our gospel reading for today, we seem to have been given a formula for resolving conflict and restoring right relationship. If someone has sinned, harming you or others, go to them, Jesus teaches. Tell them. And if they do not listen, bring a friend or two with you. Together, approach the person who has caused harm again. Share your testimony again. And if even in the presence of others, they still refuse to listen, go then to the church. And with the church, speak your peace, speak of the harm, speak of the impact of their sin. And if then they still do not listen, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, this last bit of the teaching is a bit confusing, I have to say. It seems like the gotcha moment. If they don't listen the third time, then throw them out. Treat them as the non-believer. Treat them as the evil, greedy tax collector, an agent of abusive power. Treat them as such. Yet, when we look at how Christ interacted with pagans and non-believers, both Jewish and Gentile, and when we look at how Christ interacted with tax collectors like Zacchaeus, like the gospel writer of Matthew himself, who was a tax collector, we see nothing but gentleness, love, and a willingness to draw the circle wider and bring them in. So what do we do with this? 
As a Christian in conflict, what are we to do? There's a temptation, I think, when in conflict to focus on how the person who has been wronged voices their pain. Protest in this way, not that way, then I'll listen to you. You didn't speak up quickly enough. You waited too long, the statute of limitations has passed. Sorry, nope, I can't hear you. You should be over this by now, we've already addressed this. Or a favorite, you just misunderstood, this was just a big miscommunication, you're overreacting. I confess this is one I often turn to when I'm in a corner. These are classic responses to human pain and the consequences of human sin. These defensive responses can happen in our most intimate relationships and in our most public of discourses. Being told that we did something or participated in something that harmed someone else is not an easy pill to swallow. But I didn't mean to, that wasn't my intention. Well, you just, you just aren't being fair. You need to see it how I see it. Well, it's not that big of a deal. Or just the classic, you're wrong. You just aren't thinking about it rationally. Or really, you just aren't thinking about it how I am. But, 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 you know, for being a pastor, when my back is against the wall and I feel cornered and defensive, but especially if I'm in an argument with my family or heaven forbid, a disagreement with my wife, I love the word, but. There's a temptation when we feel defensive to distance ourselves from conflict, from pain, from sin, from how we can wrong, from how we can hurt one another. And protecting ourselves from sin, especially if our sin has had a hand in furthering pain or harm is only natural. It's an element of self-defense. But when our defenses go up, our listening skills, at least my listening skills, the very things Christ names multiple times in this teaching about conflict go down. It's like our defenses become shutters, blocking out everything else around us and listening becomes a one-way monologue with ourselves. Has anyone else been there? Thanks for those hands. <laughs> yeah, Christ's teaching for when we are in conflict is simple, yet always the simplicity is hard. Listen. Listen when someone comes to you. But if that doesn't work, listen when they come to you again with witnesses. Take their word for it, even if it doesn't at first make sense to you. Listen to understand, not to win. A hard one, especially for me if I'm in political debates. Listen to understand, not to win. Listen for the pain beneath the words not just the words that are being said themselves. Listen. And if still that doesn't work, if you still can't hear or understand, listen to the church. The church is no, by no means perfect, no institution is. But if you don't hear at first, and if later you still don't hear or understand, listen again to the beloved church, the body of Christ. Listen as if the person speaking to you is speaking with Christ's heart and Christ's body. Again, you might not understand, you might not feel that they are right, you might not agree with them, but listen, Christ says. For when there is listening, comprehension can follow. And when we comprehend, we can empathize. And when empathy comes, we might be able to understand if we have caused harm and what the impact of that look, looks like and feels like, regardless of whether or not the harm was intentional or not. And once we understand that, we can know how to move forward. Reverend Gregory Bentley, the co-moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA, says there are five R's that the church needs in order to eradicate white supremacy and repair the church's torrid relationship with systemic racism. The five R's are as follows. Remembrance, remorse, repentance, repair, and reconciliation. For those who, like me, aren't auditory learners, I'll say it one more time. It's remembrance, remorse, repentance, repair, and reconciliation. These five R's, I think, apply to all forms of harm. Whether we're thinking about vast systemic harm of white supremacy, thanks Phoebe, 
or the personal individual harm that can occur between loved ones. We can look to the five R's. Remember, be willing to feel remorse, repent, and then as it is possible, repair and reconcile. Let's take the example of saying something we shouldn't have to a loved one, a pickle I think we've all been in before. I'm sure you've been there in the heat of an argument and you say that one thing you know that will be hurtful because you know just how it's gonna land. Now first, remember that you did indeed say that and that you did know what it would mean. Remember that that's a part of your history and maybe why you knew to say that. We need to be willing to remember and own up to what we said and the impact of our words. We can't pretend we didn't say them or didn't mean them. We have to acknowledge and remember. And once we're willing to remember, then can come remorse or feeling regret. It's tempting to skip this stage. It's much easier to jump to empty apologies and symbolic gestures. It's far easier to say, oh, I'm so sorry you feel that way. I'm so sorry you heard it that way. Or I'm sorry, I really, I genuinely, I really, I really didn't mean it that way. I know I've given all three of these apologies to Kate <laughs> on the regular. Instead of cheap remorse, Reverend Bentley teaches, we need to let ourselves feel genuine remorse, letting ourselves feel regret or guilt. Importantly though, we must avoid getting stuck at this stage. It's tempting to be frozen by guilt, to have guilt drive a wedge between people. And guilt that binds itself to privilege has an uncanny way of preventing progress towards healing and reconciliation. We must be willing to feel guilt, but we must remember that guilt is not the destination or the goal. Remorse can instead be a tool towards understanding, where it can soften our hearts opening us to newer, healthier ways of being in relationship with one another. By recognizing when we have gotten it wrong, we can more fully move towards how to get it right. Following remorse, there comes the opportunity to repent, to apologize, to express sincere penitence, not making the apology about our feelings, but about the feelings of the one that has been harmed. Now with remembrance, remorse, and repentance, present then follows room for repair. Maybe this means being patient so that healing can take place. Maybe that means opening ourselves up to listen more to the other layers of impact of harm that we still couldn't yet hear. Maybe that means something simple like creating opportunities for connection or trust to occur. Repair is something that can only occur when both the person who causes the harm and the person who is harmed is ready. This can drive us mad, the patience that this can require. But it turns out healing can't be rushed and isn't on a timeline. And if repair comes about, then reconciliation and even restoration might be able to follow. In Matthew 18, Jesus doesn't lay out these five R's. He doesn't share this helpful alliteration from Reverend Bentley, this roadmap to right relationship, that's a lot of ours, this roadmap to right relationship. And we shouldn't see Reverend Bentley's response to conflict and harm as the golden ticket roadmap, roadmap for all situations. But Christ, Christ does emphasize the importance of listening. And when we listen, we enable remembrance and remorse. When we listen, we make space for authentic repentance. And when we really listen, it is in our listening and understanding that we might better know how to step forward towards repair and reconciliation with those that are most dear to us, like our family, and those we barely know at all, like our neighbor. So how are Christians meant to deal with conflict? This sermon truly can't answer all of these questions, neither can this one gospel reading. But when we look to Christ and his instructions to listen, we might just find Paul and his teachings to love. For to feel truly heard is to feel truly loved. So next time conflict creeps into your day, slow down and listen. Slow down and love. For where love is, 
indeed siblings in Christ. That is where God is also. Amen. No. members of the choir. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jake, for putting it all together. And now it's time for our first full Zoom communion. Uh, and we're happy to, ha ha to try this today. Uh, we're, we'd love to have your suggestions. Uh, and so if you wish, you can put on speaker view if you'd like to see Jenny and me, or you can put on uh, gallery view uh, if you wish uh, to see everybody. And so everyone is welcome at this Christ table. It is a table of forgiveness, not a table of judgment. Today, we want to hold the space for all of you to bring your beliefs about communion here. Some of you may wish to eat bread and drink wine you have with you at home, as we would at Battelle. Others may wish to fast from communion until we can be together physically again. There's no right or wrong decision, for Christ meets each of us here. After we say and sing the great prayer of Thanksgiving, if you wish to receive, please have your elements in reach. Uh, that can be any kind of bread or juice or a beverage. If you do not wish to receive but would like a blessing, a general blessing will be offered after the communion is served. And so we now invite you to unmute yourself as you wish. Throughout the prayers, there'll be opportunities to speak prayers aloud and to sing, and you're invited to unmute, say or sing the responses as you wish, or uh, mute yourself. Phoebe will post your responses in the chat, or you may follow along in your bulletin. Now let us join in the ancient prayer of the church. You can find the prayer in the bulletin or the chat. God be with you. No, and also, also with, you. with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up God. 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 Let us give thanks to God. It is right, it is right to right. give our thanks and our praise. It is indeed right to thank you for you made us. And before us, you made the world we inhabit. And before the world, you made the eternal home in which, through Christ, we have a place. All that is spectacular, all that is plain, have their origin in you. All that is lovely, 
all who are loving, point to you as their fulfillment. And grateful as we are for the world we know and the universe beyond our ken, we particularly praise you, whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus. For his life, which informs our living, for his compassion, which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, which contradicts our harmless generalities, for his challenging presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise you and we worship him. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church on earth and in heaven, and we'll sing together the Sanctus. Among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Later, he took a cup of wine and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As he offered himself, so we offer ourselves to you as we join together in the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ will come again. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. Again. Yeah. again. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and wine and fill them with the fullness of Christ. And let that same spirit rest on each of us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose meal we now share. And we say, Amen. 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 You're now invited to say together the prayer Jesus taught us so long ago in whatever language or translation is most at home to you. Our Father. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Your kingdom come. Your will, come. Your will, will be, done. be done on earth, on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. Forgive, our debts, forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And, we forgive our debtors. and lead us not lead us into, into temptation. And deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the kingdom, the glory, the power, and the glory are yours forever and ever. And ever. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now we invite you to eat or fast.
And now for those abstaining, we'll say this blessing as we would in Batel. May God bless you with strength and safety. May Christ be truly present in you and in your life. And may the Holy Spirit inspire in you a holy, joyful time. Amen. Amen. Let us now join together in our prayer after communion. You can find this in the bulletin or Phoebe will be posting it in the chat. This time, um, I invite all of us to mute ourselves, but say it aloud together and we'll know we are in one voice. God of abundance, you make us one as your body and your people. Wherever we are, we are one in you. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now let us join together in singing our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tide That Binds. morning church it's wonderful to be with you all to worship this morning and wonderful to see your faces my name is natalie and i'm a second year masters of divinity student at the divinity school and also the ucy intern for this year and i have a few announcements to share with you all this morning um, first i'd like to invite you all to a 30-minute zoom community gathering following the organ postlude right after this. So all you have to do is stay on the call and join us for a more informal time of gathering with others from the church. We will also be having our catechesis student study group that's meeting every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. We'll be studying 1 Corinthians with Ian and other students. So all students are welcome to join no matter how much knowledge you have about 1 Corinthians. So if you'd like the Zoom link for that meeting, you can contact Pastor Ian or you can sign up at the church.yale.edu website for the newsletter. We'd also like to welcome a new member to our community, Rebecca Aaron, who you saw play the prelude before the service this morning. She is our new UCY organist. She is a Canadian, um, a graduate of Indiana University, but is now living in New York City. So she's been everywhere. And we hope that you'll get a chance to meet her at some point She's currently a master's student at the Institute of Sacred Music. And now I'll pass it to Pastor Jenny for one more announcement. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so on Friday, Phoebe and Natalie reached out to us, um, to Ian and I, and let us know that there is a national scholar strike that is happening this Tuesday and Wednesday across the US. 
Now this was news to Ian and I, so some of you may have heard about it. For others of you, it may be the first time that you're hearing about it. But uh, if you heard about what the WNBA, the NBA, and a few MLB teams um, did strikes a couple of weeks ago for greater racial justice in our country. And in response to this, professors Anthea Butler and Kevin Gannon, um, two professors from around the country, also wanted to follow suit with a scholar strike. And they're organizing it with faculty from all over the country and new faculty are joining all the time, um, including many faculty from Yale Divinity School, including the Dean, Dean Gregory Sterling, and possibly more at Yale. Yale always seems to happen last minute. So I imagine the rest of the Yale community will find out late Monday evening that this is something that this is happening. Now the strike is an opportunity for academia to slow down business as usual and dedicate time to learning about engaging in racial justice work. Some faculty members may cancel their classes and send out resources for students to read. Many are not canceling class, but they'll be dedicating their courses on Tuesday and Wednesday to racial justice, justice work as it applies to the disciplines that they're teaching. Our leadership team and our church would like to do the same. So in light of this, you're invited to join us on Tuesday evening for a screening on Zoom of the film, I Am Not Your Negro, an excellent film about the late, great James Baldwin. It'll be on Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. All are welcome. And following the 90 minute film, we'll have a brief discussion to process the movie. If you're interested in coming to this, send me a private chat um, or uh, email me. On Wednesday, Reverend Ian will adapt Wednesday night's catechesis, study of 1 Corinthians, to specifically <clears throat> be about studying a passage in 1 Corinthians and thinking about racial justice. Uh, again, if you're interested in participating in this or just learning more, feel free to reach out to Natalie, Phoebe, Reverend Ian, or myself. And now we move to our benediction, the good words of Micah. I invite you all to unmute yourselves and join together in the benediction from the words of the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord? And I'll call myself, call myself God, God, God on high. high. God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. To do justice. To do justice. And to love kindness. To love, to love, love kindness. kindness. And to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with our God. Amen. Now go in peace in the name of God who covers us with steadfast love and calls us to share this love with the world. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Welcome back, everybody. Great to see you. Great job with service today. Great job, Jenny. Love the comments about your sermon. Uh, great to have Rebecca with us. Uh, she is getting started. She, I don't think she has her visa yet. So she's uh, trying to figure out how to make the transition to, uh, to starting up here, but she's done a great job. And thanks to Megan and Jake for putting everything together and to all our singers. Uh, Megan has done an amazing job uh, in a circumstance she did not anticipate. <laughs> in terms of uh, leading a virtual choir, but she's done a great job. So it is great to see you all again. Uh, other things, Jenny? 